Well, hello, everybody. It's a couple minutes after two, so I think we'll go ahead and get started with the webinar. Um, the webinar today is Organic Disease Management in Cucurbit Crops. I'm Andrew Smith. I'm the Chief Scientist here at Rodale Institute. And this project uh, that we're working on was uh, in collaboration with my colleagues, Dr. Gladys Sinati and Rick Carr. Um, a little bit of background on myself. I've been working in vegetable production and uh, integrated pest management and vegetable production for a little bit over 20 years now. And I have a background in, in vegetable production, but really my, uh, my academic background is in entomology and insect pest management. Uh, Dr. Gladys Anadi has been working on horticultural uh, fertility as well as pest management systems for over 20 years now. And Rick Carr is our farm director, but he also has his master's in plant pathology. So we really want to also thank and acknowledge the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Uh, this was a, a project that was funded by a specialty crop block grant from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And they funded several projects over the last uh, several years uh, focused on disease or insect pest management in organic systems. So we're very thankful for their support. Before we get started, Okay, there we go. My slide wasn't advancing. I want you to take a look at the bottom of your screens. If you scroll your cursor down, you should see this symbol that says Q&A. That's what we're gonna use to answer questions. So that at the end, uh, I hope we have plenty of time to answer your questions. Uh, I want you, I'm just, I say that I want you to go there because I don't want you to go to the chat button, um, which one I won't be going to look at afterwards and we don't have it recorded. Uh, as a practice, but also to, for us to get a chance to know who we have out there, I'd like everyone who's on to, to go down and click on that Q&A. And if you wouldn't mind, tell us what cucurbit crop. So, you know, I guess I should have started on what a cucurbit crop is. Um, I assume that if people were interested in this topic, they probably knew what cucurbit crops are, but uh, cucurbit crops are, are those are in the family of cucurbitaceae. Um, so those are things like melons and, and squash and cucumbers and gourds. Um, but anyway, if you could go to the Q&A and tell us what cucurbit crops you grow, uh, how many acres you grow of uh, cucurbit crops, and what is the number one disease you find uh, you have a difficult with. Um, so that would give you some practice on using the Q&A but it also give us some information about who, who we who are here and, and what we need to continue to work on in our research and education at Rodale Institute. So we've been doing several projects on squash production and squash disease and insect management, um, really because we know that it's a, it's a major crop that vegetable growers are producing. Um, it, it isn't in the top five of total acreage, um, vegetable crops because you have things like potatoes and snap beans and uh, lettuce and some and onions that tend to be grown on large acreage and harvested mechanically. Uh, but what we see here from this slide is that the majority of farmers that grow vegetables are also growing some sort of uh, cucurbit crop. So the number this is from the U.S. Ag Census in 2017. Uh, Farmers that grew squash, there was over 22,000 farmers that grew, grew squash. So those were winter squash and pumpkins. And there was over 18,000 farmers in the U.S. that grew summer squash. Um, so a lot of people are growing squash. There's a lot of interest in it. Um, we have a lot of work now looking at the nutritional qualities of, of fruits and vegetables. And so a lot of the squashes are highly nutritious. And um, so whenever I start talking about pest management. So we're talking about disease management in cucurbit crops. I really like to start with this integrated pest management triangle. And, and what this is really showing is, is that we should be putting a greater amount of our energy and our resources in the lower parts of the triangle. So prevention, uh, cultural practices, physical, mechanical practices, which often sometimes are lumped into cultural practices. Uh, biological control strategies, and then, then chemical 
strategies are used as a last resort. Um, and in, and if, if, if not necessary, then we shouldn't even be using them. Um, if you go online and you look at a lot of different people describe what integrated pest management is, you know, I, I define it as uh, integrated methods and using multiple tactics to be able to control and manage pests. A lot of times you just see it as scouting to determine whether or not you should or should not spray. Well, really that almost all falls really in the chemical approach. That's not really um, an integrated pest management approach. And I have on this slide, you know, that we, you know, there are times when we need to use chemicals and there are chemicals available for organic production. Um, you know, organic production isn't completely chemical free. There are different chemicals. They're not usually restricted use chemicals. Um, and we're going to talk about some chemicals that can be used. But I really want to make it very clear that obviously if you're, if you're certified organic um, or you're, you're following organic guidelines, you really want to look at OMRI or the Organic Material Review Institute uh, listing to make sure that the chemicals that you plan to use are listed and allowed in organic uh, production. And, and beyond just looking to see if it's on a list, you really ought to make sure that it is allowed for the crop that you, that you plan to use and in the manner that you plan to use it. Because some, some products are still restricted uh, even though they have an OMRI seal. So let's jump into it a little bit. Let's start with prevention and then get to the chemical approach. Um, you know, when I think of prevention, I think of anything that we can, you know, the word prevent, uh, the disease that, might, that we might have from getting into the field, onto the crop and infecting the crop and creating symptoms that are gonna have some impact on, on your bottom line. Uh, so the, to me, this things like keeping your tools and surfaces and greenhouses clean, um, as well as tractors and implements that are going to go between fields. And it's always a good idea to, uh, you know, spray down tractors, disinfect pruners, wipe down surfaces in greenhouses. Um, you know, it's probably a good idea at the end of each year or periodically to disinfect your entire greenhouse, especially if that's where you're. Uh, producing transplants. Uh, to consider that these diseases can hitchhike on, on people and on clothes. Um, kind of the classic example of prevention is not allowing anyone to smoke uh, either on your farm or in your greenhouse or buildings because of the tobacco mosaic virus that can easily transmit to things like tomatoes and peppers um, and eggplant. Uh, Remember that when you damage plants, that you're leaving, you're creating a wound for infection. So when you walk through a field, um, not only are you damaging plants, but there's a chance that you have some damage on those plants already from either wildlife that go in there that are in the field or from uh, wind that blew. And if you're carrying the disease with you, then you're, you're easily infecting that plant. I put on this list proper composting. You'll see composting come back up in a biological control strategy. Um, but I know a lot of organic farmers are using compost in their transplant media, um, you know, the trans organically approved transplant media is, is pretty expensive. It makes a lot of sense to, to create your own. And uh, for that reason, you know, sometimes you don't, you, you're using your old vegetable waste or composting. And I'm just, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm highlighting here is ensure that your compost pile is getting up to a temperature that will kill the pathogens. Uh, make sure that all of the crop that you're using, the crop residues are completely decomposed. Um, so that's very important. And the thing that I think is probably the most important and should really, you should really devote the majority of your time and effort from a disease control or disease management standpoint is crop rotation. Uh, this is probably a cultural control or management decisions, but to me, it come, I put it under prevention because if we can properly rotate crops in the field, 
we can, to, to many cases, prevent diseases from even being there in the field and, and maybe not completely eliminate the, the disease, but uh, get it at such a lower level that it, it won't be symptomatic. And if you look at this, I put this crop rotation on organic farms, a planning man manual. Um, you know, this is a classic publication or manual. It's put out by SARE. I would urge everybody after this, um, after this webinar, if you haven't looked at that, to go on the web, uh, look it up, find it, print it out or download it, um, and, and use it as a tool for your farm. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about crop rotation in a minute as we go forward here. So in order to manage a disease successfully with crop rotations, uh, you wanna know how long the pathogen survives in the soil. So what you're, you know, the strategy of crop rotation to a large extent is, is waiting or, or, or allowing time to pass uh, before you put a crop back in the same field so that the pathogen can, to, the, to a large extent, die. Um, some, some diseases or pathogens uh, can live in the soil for up to 20 or more years. Um, and the majority of diseases can live for um, at least three years. So a lot of times you hear uh, plant pathologists or specialists recommend at least a three-year crop rotation. Um, we find a lot of successful organic farmers are following a seven, even sometimes a nine to 12 year crop rotation, meaning that the same crop is not gonna come back into that field for seven years or 12 years. And in those cases, we have almost complete prevention of uh, at least soil-borne diseases and in many cases, other uh, diseases. It's important to know which plant the disease infects, um, ways that it can survive, um, how it can be spread. We're gonna talk about a few very specific cases of diseases that are prevalent in cucurbit crops that really uh, crop rotation won't, won't really help. You're, you're probably gonna have these diseases uh, every year or you're gonna, they could be coming in from other, other means. And so we'll talk about them. And then it's also important to know what management tools you, you have to mitigate these diseases. In some cases, if you know uh, how the crop survives, like if it survives on crop residue, things like mowing that residue so it breaks down faster or incorporate it into the soil might be an important strategy. And this, this manual has a lot of very important details that will help you to answer all of those questions. So we don't have the time talk about every disease and, um, and the life cycle of every single disease, but this manual can help you with that. Uh, in this manual, they show you some success, successful farmers that are vegetable farmers. And if you look on these charts, the, the cucurbit crops are in orange. And you can see that they are following, in this case, a five-year crop rotation, where if you follow that rotation, the, the winter squash in the first column or the cucurbits in the second column uh, will never be back on that field for at least five years. Um, just a couple other strategies that I've seen is <clears throat> once you, let's say, work out a pretty good strategy where you feel comfortable and confident in your crop rotation, uh, maybe you have a three to five year crop rotation. Uh, what I've seen a lot of farms do is have two areas of their farm where they follow a crop rotation on one area for different crops they're growing and then on the other area they have a separate crop rotation and then maybe after four or five years they completely flip-flop those. Um, <clears throat> in that case it could be 10 or more years before the same crop is ever back on the same field. Another recommendation both for breaking up disease cycles but also for building soil health would be to have a portion of your farm that you rotate out of vegetable crops and maybe grow a hay crop or a field crop if you have that possibility. I know that's sometimes difficult because the equipment and that you need for field crop production or hay production vegetable farmers don't have, um, but if you're able to find a neighbor or somebody down the street that could uh, 
to do that for you, it might be a, a good strategy. I'm part of a, a advisory committee for a group in Europe to, that received funding um, from the EU called, and it's called Best for Soil. And if, if you go into this organic or crop rotation on organic farms, you're gonna find uh, sheets full of information that you know I think it would be in your best interest to print out. I think it's almost impossible to read them all if you, uh, you know, it's all on computer. Um, to me, I would print them out and I would lay them out on a table and I would use that to help my, with my crop rotations. Um, but that, you know, obviously it's arduous. You have to go back and forth on these tables. Um, but this group in Europe called Best for Soil has created a database where you can actually put, your, put the different crops in that you're thinking about and it'll instantly create a plant crop, what they call a scheme. Um, and I, I think it would be great if we were to take the data that we have in the rotation planning manual and see if we can put it into a database that can be used. So here's just an example. Um, when I went on here, I chose Ireland. Um, I chose Ireland because uh, England isn't part of the EU and Ireland's an Eng English speaking country. So I assumed I was going to get my everything back to me in English. Um, and I chose what might be a typical crop rotation. I have corn, then potato, and then pumpkin. And in this case, I put as a highlight of how cover crops can be a benefit. I put vetch uh, after my corn and rye after growing potato. Um, and you have the ability in here to change your um, which crops come first. I don't want to get really into it, but basically color is telling you the severity um, or of the susceptibility of that crop to the, this is, in this case, it's soil-borne diseases. Uh, you can also choose nematodes. Um, and you can see, so purple is, is highly severe. These are problems on, in this case, pumpkin. We see pythium and verticillium could be a major, uh, major uh, disease in pumpkins, but it's not so much of a severe disease on the other crops. Um, some of the other, the, the letters A, B, and C are telling you what part of the plant uh, are infected, which goes into how, uh, how long they might persist in the soil and some management decisions. Uh, the, the square block is telling you that, that this crop's actually a host. Um, one thing I learned from this group, which, which was interesting, is that a lot of crops can be a host, but not show any symptoms. And so that's one, another reason to be so, to, to, to kind of vet uh, our crop rotations even more. And, it, and in some cases, in many cases, actually, the, the low levels of disease uh, can actually be causing yield yield declines um, even though you don't see major symptoms and part of that can be because the disease is proliferated in the soil over time and I just use this as another example where I just chose another what might be a fairly common crop rotation where we have beans cabbage cucumbers and tomatoes they're all in different plant families so I feel good that you know if they're because they're in different plant families they shouldn't have um, shouldn't host the same diseases. Um, but you can see in this scenario, uh, they're all highly susceptible uh, to pythium and sclerotonia. And so I might want to consider having either cover crops to help break up those pest cycles um, or consider at least go through a few other uh, crop rotation schemes and see if I can improve, improve this in some way. So that's a tool and those are the things that I think are gonna become more and more available um, as we use technology like computers and, and, and internet. Uh, so now I'm moving to cultural controls. These are, again, things that you can manage on your farm. Uh, spacing is important. I, I put this picture here, one, to show that you can trellis. Um, trellising is obviously can help because if you can get the crop up off the ground, 
uh, you can control disease. And a lot of the majority of the, the foliar diseases that that um, the crops get are a splash up from the ground. So by trellising them, we can get them off the ground. Um, we can use things like ground covers to also prevent splashing in some way, whether that's plastic mulch or straw mulch. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our uh, no-till cover crop method, where we also would create a barrier from disease. Um, but it's also important to consider spacing. To me, I look at this field of cucumbers and it looks way too densely spaced. Um, there could be tremendous amount of production, um, but it seems to me that it also is set up for a tremendous amount of, uh, there's not good air flow through there. So basically a lot of, most diseases also form when leaves are wet and they stay wet for a long period of time. Um, so you want good airflow to be able to dry leaves out to prevent spread of disease. <clears throat> Weed control is also very important, partly because it also helps mitigate airflow and allow you know more you know, allow more airflow so leaves can dry out. Uh, weeds, some of the weeds can also be hosts for disease. So keeping good weed control is a major. I know it's very difficult in organic production. Um, but it's also very important for disease management. Uh, resistant varieties is, is probably one of the most important uh, strategies that we have available to us. And I would say this is becoming more and more, uh, varieties are becoming more available to organic farmers. Uh, when I started 20 years ago or so, a lot of times you couldn't even, you know, you couldn't even get organic varieties, that wasn't even a thing really. Um, so there's become more varieties that are organically approved or certified organic available. And in many cases, they are, um, you know, they are resistant to disease because more, even in organic, more than in conventional production, we need to focus on these cultural practices um, because we don't have the tools, the chemical tools available to us. Um, so we don't have that as a fallback measure. So I would say that using resistant varieties is an important thing to think about if you're an organic grower. Uh, irrigation is important. Like I said before, wet leaves are often uh, prone to be disease leaves. So overhead irrigation systems are more likely to splash and spread disease. Um, where you're getting that irrigation water from, like if it's from a pond, that could also be a reservoir for disease. So consider filters and cleaning your filters and disinfecting filters and things like that um, because you could be spreading disease around. Uh, we would always advocate, if possible, for drip irrigation systems that go you know, right where the root is and prevent overhead, uh, overhead irrigation. Uh, fertility is a, a very important part. We know that if, if a plant is growing healthy and vigorously, um, it, can, it, is, you know, it can defend itself better. Um, but then there's also a lot of different nutrients that we know are beneficial for disease prevention. Things like potassium and boron and sulfur um, and silica is another one that has been shown, especially for cucurbit, uh, powdery mildew disease uh, on cucurbits to prevent that. So in our soils, there's uh, how we have, we have, most soils have more silica in them than plants need, but it's usually locked up in a form that isn't uh, soluble, so the plant can't take it up. Um, and I'm, as we move to biological control, that's something to think about because if we can improve the biology of our soil, uh, there's better opportunity for those microbes to extract silicas out of the, the clay and the, the rock particles in our soil, make them available to the plant and make the plant more healthy and resilient and resistant to disease. And before I move on to biological, I wanna talk a little bit about scouting. So scouting is periodically going out into your field and looking at your field to make decisions about, you know, make pest management decisions. 
And you know, that's kind of a bridge to chemical control because we really shouldn't be making decisions about chemical controls or chemical management um, if we don't have good evidence that it's needed in the field. Um, one, you know, as I, as I, before I move, one cultural project that I don't have here that I just thought about is timing. And part of that gets into scouting because we, you know, you see here we're using black plastic. Black plastic gives us the advantage of getting crops in earlier, um, accelerating their growth. And a lot of times we can get a crop in the field and out of the field uh, before disease is even prevalent. Um, for that crop. So considering the timing uh, of, your, of your crop and when the disease is actually there in the field and, and looking at those manuals and other resources will help you know that and probably your own experience as well. But of course, a lot of vegetable growers are growing multiple successions. They, uh, here we're growing squash, um, but you, you know, think maybe they have cucumbers. You want cucumbers uh, all year long. So you, you don't have that luxury of growing the crop and then getting it out before the disease starts. So you might have to make some chemical, uh, chemical control decisions. So what we do in, this is in the vegetable systems trial, uh, looking at our squash, we have an intern, two interns that are with Gladys uh, scouting and she showed them how to scout. Um, but we want to, in, in a typical field, you want to scout 50 leaves per field. So depending on how big that field is, you know, maybe if it's bigger, you want to do more than 50 leaves. Uh, we do 50 leaves per plot. So each one of our uh, systems has four different replicates. So we're actually looking at 200 leaves across the entire field. And then we treat that entire system across the field as one, as one, um, you know, one field, so to speak. So we don't just spray a plot, we, we spray all four plots if we make a decision on, on disease control chemically. So what we do is we go to a plant and we'll take uh, 10 leaves per plant. Um, if you look at the where the, the squash is now, you can pretty easily know where a plant is and look in that plant. Um, but if you're looking that, if you come back to that same field in a couple of weeks, uh, those, all those vines might be vined out. You might have a really tough time finding uh, what, plant, what leaf belongs to the plant and where it goes to. So we really say uh, 10 leaves per plant location. Um, so you're going to come to a location and you're going to count 10 leaves and then you're going to move to another location and scout 10 leaves. And you can do that five times either in your field, in our case, in our, in our plot. And that's going to give us uh, 50 leaves that we looked at on both the upper side and lower side. And we're also, if there is fruit in the field, we're going to take a look at five different fruit in that location. And obviously, you know, you could get to, I don't know, zucchini or summer squash, and there might be more than five fruit right there in that one plant. Um, but something like pumpkin, uh, you probably aren't going to have five fruit in that location or, or on that plant. So the things that we record are cucumber beetles, both striped and spotted cucumber beetles, uh, squash bugs, as well as squash bug, squash bug eggs. You usually see the eggs, um, well, you might see the adult squash bugs in very low numbers, um, but then you usually see the squash bug eggs. And that gives you an indication that you, you're about to have an outbreak. Um, we haven't really seen a lot of aphids or mites, um, but those are on the scouting sheet. Uh, I would suspect that the, one of the reasons we're not seeing a lot is because we're on a very diverse farm and we're not using chemicals. So a lot of times aphids and mites are secondary outbreak. They, they, they're the result of a secondary outbreak where you sprayed insecticides and you've killed your beneficials and then they, they, can, now, uh, they can now proliferate in the absence of any enemies. Uh, but we're also going to scout for powdery mildew and, and I'm going to be talking and downy mildew and I'm going to be talking specifically about both powdery mildew and downy mildew in a few minutes. And so uh, a little bit about biological controls. There's Rick out in the compost yard 
And uh, just a couple, you know, quick things about compost. And you may not think about it as a disease prevention, um, but most of the studies that we look at in the organic system are, you know, we find greater diversity, greater microbial diversity, um, and we also find lower levels of pathogens. And we think a lot of that has to do with compost use. Uh, studies that have used compost and then infected plants um, have found that if you, if you take compost, uh, feed a plant, and then infect the plant with the disease, and then you take compost that has been sterilized or heat treated so that you kill all the biology and infect the disease, what we find very often is that the compost treatment that's alive has disease suppressive properties where the compost treatment that's dead does not. So that's telling us that by feeding and improving the life in our soil, uh, we're having an effect on disease suppression. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about compost teas, but there's more and more foliar sprays, uh, things that have plant phyto hormones in them that could boost the immune, immunity of, of your plant. Um, cover crops are also a biological control because they, a lot of them have uh, properties that are improving the soil. They might also be a chemical control because they break down and relief these chemicals um, like the glucocyanates that are in brassicas that can kill some diseases as well as nematodes. Um, they're important. And there's biopesticides that are out there and available. Uh, let me briefly talk about compost teas. Um, you know, one thing that makes it difficult with compost teas and to recommend compost teas is that, you know, everybody makes them different. Everybody makes them with different components. It's hard to say how effective uh, the compost tea I make is compared to the compost tea that, that you make is. Um, there's certainly, I, I wanted to show this because there's evidence that compost tea does control diseases. Um, but it's hard for me sometimes or your extension scientist to make a recommendation on compost teas compared to a, a chemical, you know, come from the jug chemical that you can test and you know it's the same every single time. Um, but in this study, looking at powdery mildew on melons, uh, the researchers looked at an aerated compost tea and a non-aerated compost tea. And they had different substrates that were used to make the, the compost. So there was spent mushroom, uh, there was uh, grape pumice, so what comes out after you press grapes. Um, crop residue, which is probably the most prevalent, especially if you're a vegetable grower and you have uh, extra waste from your packing house or from your fields. And then a cop residue compost that was actually uh, from vermicompost or worm compost. And what you can see if compared to the control, which was just a, a, a water spray with no compost, uh, you see reduced disease or disease suppression. Um, the, the vermicompost, which in many cases uh, you see this uh, the vermicompost comes out better than all the other uh, compost teas. But what it looked like it is, is that aerating the tea in this case uh, didn't really have much of a, a benefit except for in the case of spent mushroom. Um, and all of the compost teas had a suppressive effect on powdery mildew. And I had their biopesticides. And so we have on our, I just wanna highlight that on our website, um, there's, you can find more information about how to make compost teas. Um, you can see there at our website, if you search around a little bit and go to, go to the science tab, you'll find more articles um, and probably under the education tab as well. So I just want to quickly mention microbial biopesticides. You know, one thing that we, we run into is that it's hard to know. We don't, we don't do it at Rodale, really do specific testing of or testing the specific products to verify their effectiveness. Um, we work more on systems. Um, but that being said, we had a lot of questions on different products and whether or not um, they're actually effective. So I, I think this is a great publication that comes from eOrganic. Uh, that's a good website to go to to find information um, because it actually shows us some information about what's been tested, whether it's been tested, um, 
So just to run through this, this is what you'll find if you go to that publication. Uh, you have the bacterial organism on the left. You have the trade name so you know how to find it. The target disease, what crops it, the disease inf infects. And in this case, the plus sign under the efficacy column tells us that scientific studies show that it is beneficial um, in controlling bacterial spot, if we're looking at the first column. They also would show you a plus minus, which means that some studies show that it is beneficial, some studies show that it is not beneficial. Uh, the other, it also indicate whether it has not been shown to be beneficial at all, or if there's no data to really support the support. Because I know a lot of you are probably just coming out of going to conferences and trade shows and uh, everybody's going to tell you how effective their, their product is. Um, but this is a place where you can go and really see what the science is telling us. And I would say we need more of this. And, and luckily, uh, more of these studies are getting done and are available to us. So now we're moving to chemicals. We recognize that there's times when all of our other strategies are, are not going to work. And uh, it's, it's probably a good economic decision to spray the field. Um, from a disease management standpoint, probably copper, copper and sulfur are the most uh, widely used and widely available, some of the cheaper uh, products that are available. Um, but more and more, they're becoming oils and botanical extracts that are available that are effective. Um, I put another, another link to an e-organic article that in this case is looking at biochemical biopesticides that may be used in organic farming. I just want to briefly mention because I, I, I often field questions about, well, isn't copper and sulfur destructive to the environment? Aren't they even, uh, and, and really all of these in, when used in excess, yes, they can be destructive to the environment. Um, most of these, well, not the oils and botanical extracts, most of them will readily break down because they're naturally products, they're natural products. So they're, they'll readily break down in the environment um, from microbial activity or from sun, um, that's a, a challenge organic farmers often have is, is keeping them on the crop for more than a day or two. Um, copper and sulfur, there is a potential that they could build up in the soil and become toxic in the soil. For that reason, I would recommend soil tests at least every three years, and you should be monitoring your soil if you're using these products. But in many cases, you know, copper, for example, may be used sometimes on squash, but there, there's, you might go years when you don't use it at all on the field. Um, we are using it in potatoes, but if, you're, if you have a good crop rotation, uh, you may only use copper once or twice every five years on that field. And if that's the case, you're probably not gonna build up toxicity in the soil. Um, we still find and we're not spraying much copper, but we still find copper levels are low. We, we could use more copper in the soil. Um, the same thing with, with sulfur. And sulfur is, is an important nutrient that we're having, there's less of recently because we've cleaned up the environment. We have less acid rain, which was basically uh, sulfur that was falling out of the sky. Um, and in many cases now, soils and fields that used to be have plenty of sulfur are now deficient. So it's probably worth looking at your sulfur levels in your soil. I wanted to briefly look at a couple more difficult to control diseases um, and, and run over and kind of go through how we manage them um, or give you some strategies for managing them. Uh, bacterial wilt is one that uh, if present, you know, could wipe, could wipe out your whole field very quickly. Um, it's a bacteria, so one thing to mention about bacteria versus fungi, uh, which are the, probably the most prevalent diseases, is that it can only enter through wounds. So uh, going out into your field and harvesting and doing things that could damage the, the crop makes it more susceptible, susceptible to disease. But in this case, the bacterial will of cucurbits is being spread by both the striped and spotted cucumber beetle. 
Um, so the really only control method for this, uh, you know, even if you have a good crop rotation, if you have heavy, heavy infestation of striped cucumber beetle um, and they have bacterial wilt, then it really didn't matter how much you rotated your crops. Um, I would say that in, in, I'm gonna, in your next slide, I'm gonna show you a guide that uh, Dr. Gladys and Adi put together, um, but increasing the diversity on your farm so that you manage the insect pests is probably a better strategy. Um, the action, when I use the word action threshold, when you scout, when we go out and scout, uh, the action threshold is, is that's when you make the decision that an, an action is needed. So this is, in this case, one to three beetles per plant. So if I looked at 50 plants um, or 50 leaves in a plant, then I would want to, I, I need to see 50 beetles out there before I start to make a decision to, um, to spray. Um, but if you look at the science, in many cases, it took even more than one uh, beetle per plant to create infection. But there is, what, what happens is there is a kind of a congregation effect is what, when you start to have more and more beetles, um, it weakens the plant so they're more likely to be infected. Um, and if the beetles are infected with the disease, they send out a chemical cue to the other beetles to come feed and you quickly get that increased congregation. So if you see a plant in a field that looks like this, the best thing to do, it's never gonna produce a crop for you. The only thing that plant's going to do is infect the rest of your field. So pull that out right away and get it, destroy it, get it into your compost or burn it or, you know, get it away from your field so it isn't going to infect the rest of your field. Um, of course, remember, don't go into other uh, cucurbit fields after you've pulled it without, you know, making sure your clothes didn't get infected or your hands are washed or you're wearing gloves. Um, a couple other strategies are to use row covers. Um, if you're planting at a time when cucumber beetles are out, uh, especially you're putting small plants out, uh, they can be covered. Uh, kale and clay can also prevent the beetles from getting on the, um, getting on the plants. And sometimes uh, you see farmers that they'll, they'll actually dip uh, the clay, they're, they're, they're transplants in clay before they put them out so they don't have to use uh, too much because the, the plants, can be highly susceptible at a young age. And really the only other strategy is probably pyrethroid or pyrethrum insecticides. Um, most other insecticides don't seem to work really well. And again, if you uh, to find more information about controlling striped cucumber beetles, uh, you can go to our website and find out a little more information with the field guide that Gladys put together. Uh, Downy mildew can be especially challenging. Um, there are some resistant varieties in cucumbers and muskmelons, but most other uh, cucurba crops don't have resistant varieties available. And it's important to know that really, you know, once it's established in the plant, there's no fungicide is going to be effective. Even conventional fungicides really aren't going to be effective on this disease once it's in the plant. So everything is a preventative action. Um, and the, the best thing to do is to go to, if you see there, the CDM pipe, um, this is cucurbit, downy, mildew, and I'm gonna go to the, the next page in a second. Um, and then get a copper spray on right when you think there is a high chance of having infection in the field. Um, because what the copper is actually do is gonna kill the pathogen as it lands on the plant and prevent it from actually getting into uh, the vascular parts of the plant. Because once, it, once it's in there, you can't control it. Um, so here's the web page for the cucurbit downy mildew IPM pipe forecasting. Um, so what I've done is I go, I've gone to the alerts. So if you look at the top, you can see the alerts. Um, I now get a, an alert on my phone anytime that downy mildew is detected within 200 miles of the Rodale Institute. Um, and that tells me I need to start paying attention, probably go to this website and take a look and see where it is and what's the chance that it's gonna be in our neck of the woods soon. Uh, pay attention to storms and see whether they're 
they could blow uh, downy mildew up. Mostly, so downy mildew is moving from the south up. It can't overwinter in the north, but it can overwinter in the south. Um, so it's slowly moving up the coast throughout the year. Um, here's an example from the Penn State website where in August 1st, um, you know, and Rodale Institute is right below the A in Pennsylvania, the, at the end of the word Pennsylvania. And uh, you see on August 1st, I, I looked at it and I'd say, well, there's no risk. I don't, I don't think there's any reason to spray. And then the next day, probably because there was a storm and there was more infection detected in the region, suddenly we went to a moderate or even high risk. Um, in that case, we would want to get out with a copper spray to prevent uh, infection of downy mildew. And maybe a week later, it might go back down to low risk. So there, that's where there could be years where you, you have no reason to spray a copper for, for downy mildew. And then powdery mildew is probably the, it, what is the most common disease of cucurbit crops. Um, you're almost guaranteed that you're going to get it, uh, especially if you're growing a crop from the late summer into the fall. Um, sometimes you can escape it in early planted and fast growing crops like zucchini or cucumbers. Um, there are resistant varieties, so I'd recommend that when you're purchasing seed to look. A lot of times you see the PM uh, next to seed varieties. Um, but it's, what's characteristic is this kind of fuzzy, you know, powdery, I guess, uh, residue. It's, it's, you know, you don't see that with downy mildew. Um, you see the little postules that are on the leaf. And uh, if, you, if you suspect it, you may want to actually scout older leaves because it tends to infect older leaves first. And the action threshold there is when you see one leaf per 50 leaves. So basically, if you scout a field and you see it, um, then it's time to spray. And the faster you can spray the field, the easier or quicker, or I guess the way to say it is the better suppression you're gonna get um, to have the potential to not have to spray in the near future. You're probably gonna have to make repeated sprays, um, but you could make a spray and then scout the following week and find that, that there is an effect infection again. Um, but that's where continued scouting is important. What we've been using is sulfur. Um, Microthyle Disperse is the product we use. We, we have it, we use it on our orchard as well. So it's available to us. Um, it's relatively effective and uh, cheap. Um, but there has been some work done. Uh, Beth Gugino is the Penn State uh, plant pathology uh, specialist, uh, vegetable specialist, and, and she's done some trials and shown that neem oil as well as tea tree oil are effective on powdery mildew. So these are things you might want to try. We have scientific evidence that they are effective. Um, so moving on, and we're almost we're nearing the end, I want to quickly manage, manage the, or mention the benefit of, of cover crops. Um, the Rodale Institute, as well as some other innovative farmers in Pennsylvania and some other parts of the country, really started this uh, kind of cover, crate, cover crop based no-till system. Um, a lot of the first people to do it weren't necessarily organic and so Rodale started to develop a system, in this case we have our roller crimper, um, in a way to ki effectively kill a cover crop. So here you see on the left the roller crimper in the front of the tractor. Uh, John Good, who's a farmer nearby us, used to actually uh, farm the uh, the Rodale property is rolling down a hairy vetch cover crop and you can see what it looks like over on the right and now it's in a in, we have a heavy dense cover crop that not only is preventing disease um, it could be providing fertility and it's of, of course it's uh, controlling erosion and we could plant right into that. Um, some of the difficulties we find is finding planters that can effectively or, or transplanters especially that can effectively plant into that. But if you do a good job and it all works, then the six weeks after planting picture, you see that's the way we hope that, it, that things will look um, and you'll have good weed control. Um, farmers have been doing this around the country, so it's not just at Rodale Institute. Here's a farm in Italy and they have, they have colders and um, those are deep subsoilers that can actually mark their rows 
so they can come back in and transplant. Um, here's a farm in California where the standard practice is mostly black plastic and they're actually using it to roll down and plant eggplant. Um, so it's a, it can be a good strategy for succession planting. Uh, it's scale neutral. So here's a farmer on the left where we created a IJ manufacturing uh, who makes the roller crimper, has made one that can go on a raised bed. Um, and this, this farmer here uses mostly plastic early in the season, but really likes to be able to come back and roll and plant his tomatoes uh, later in the season. And the BCS, which may, many farmers might be using, uh, we've, we've, Gladys has done some tests the last couple of years and shown that it is effective at killing hairy vetch. Um, here you see Dan Kemper, our assistant farm manager, and we timed him last year. Uh, he can go 100 feet in 23 seconds with the BCS roller, um, and he's pretty quick with it. He can, he can turn around and come back in less than a minute. Um, and that's, I think it's a 40 inch wide roller. So, you know, he can do in, in less than a minute, he can get about six feet wide uh, of, of rolling done. So it can be pretty effective um, with small scale equipment. And where I've kind of, I think kind of where we got into a project, the one that we submitted to the Department of Agriculture for funding somewhat started back with projects and work that was going on at USDA Beltsville. Um, and then we had a project looking at organic management of tomatoes uh, planted into cover crop mulch. But what they found in Beltsville when they were growing tomatoes was that if you look at this graph on the right, uh, BP stands for black plastic and HV stands for hairy vetch. Um, and what they found in, in multiple studies over multiple years in greenhouse and in field and, and controlling in different ways was that every time the disease severity was less in hairy vetch. And they actually ultimately found that the growing hairy vetch in with tomatoes triggers a genetic response in the plant that causes it to be resistant or defend itself against, um, in this case, the septoria leaf spot. Um, so we looked at that and thought, well, geez, is that something that we could, is that something that could be important in uh, cucurbit crops or in squash? And there was a few studies that looked at hairy vetch, almost all in soil borne diseases and showed that uh, in watermelon and in pumpkins uh, that there seemed to be some disease, disease suppression, disease prevention by using hairy vetch. And one thing that we noticed in the vegetable systems trial, this is the first year of the vegetable systems trial, was this is just an observation. But what, what this is, is this is the number of leaves that have powdery mildew. So we fly out there, we've scouted the 50 leaves. This is over time. And we see that generally the conventional plants have more, uh, have more uh, number of leaves with powdery mildew. So the, the top two are both our plastic mulch treatments, the blue and the orange, but the conventional has more. And then the next two is our uh, reduced till system where we're rolling down our cover crop. And again, the conventional had a higher, uh, higher level, or higher number of leaves than the organic. And in the organic system, our cover crop is hairy vetch intercropped with cereal rye planted in the fall. In the conventional system, our cover crop is just straight rye. And we plant that at 100 pounds per acre. And the part of the rationale was that organic farmers need to use cover crops to get uh, increased the in nitrogen levels for their crops where conventional farmers can more easily use uh, things like urea and, and ammonia sulfate and different fertilizers. Um, and they don't need to spend the money on, on expensive cover crop seed and not, aren't willing to in many cases. Um, so, we, so we thought, well, maybe part of the reason that we have lowered what looks like less disease is because we're using, we're growing hairy vetch. 
Um, and I think there could be a lot of other factors, um, fertility and use and nitrogen availability and how fast the plant grows um, also could have a factor. Um, it looks like plastic mulch, which, which probably increases the availability of nitrogen and has the plant growing faster, seems to also increase infection levels. Um, and so we decided, well, let's see if we can take a look at this in the vegetable systems trial, kind of as a first pass look. Um, so our vegetable systems trial plots are all 20 foot by 80 foot long. Uh, we grow Waltham butternut squash. We, we purposely chose that variety because we know it, it's not resistant to powdery mildew, um, but it has, it has some resistance. It's not you know, completely susceptible. It's moderately resistant. Um, and we grow on those 20 foot wide, we grow three rows that are 60 inch or five foot on center. And we, the plants are spaced 24 inches within the row. Um, what we did in 2019 was we created a, an alternate cover crop in each one of the uh, plots. So in the organic, we had a quarter, a 10 foot by 40 foot plot that had only rye in it and no vetch. Um, and then we, in the conventional, we had a plot that had rye and vetch, where normally it would have been 100% rye. So we had plots where we could look at that had, had vetch um, and then had only rye in both the organic and conventional system because there is management differences, there is fertility management differences um, in here. And so our hypothesis was that the rye vetch plots will have a lower disease incidence and severity than the rye plots simply because we have vetch growing there in, in those fields. Um, and this is 2019. Our measurements were a little bit different than just counting the number of leaves. Um, we actually, we in this case, we took a ruler, a, a meter stick, and in every leaf, and every leaf that fell above that meter stick, um, we completely measured the and estimated the percent leaf uh, coverage of powdery mildew on that leaf. So we created a uh, what I'm calling I'm calling a powdery mildew severity level. Um, and if you look at our conventional and organic, uh, there was really no difference uh, between uh, conventional and organic in the powdery mildew severity. Um, and maybe this is a little, this is probably a better measurement than just the number of leaves that have some powdery mildew on them. Um, so we, when we controlled for different factors, we didn't really see a difference here between conventional and organic. Um, if we look at uh, rye versus the rye vetch, um, again, our hypothesis wasn't really, didn't really bear out. Um, the orange line here is the disease severity in the plots that had just rye planted. And the purple line, or it looks pink, but I tried to make it purple because that's the color of vetch flowers, um, but it looks more pink now. Uh, anyway, the, those are the, that's the level of disease severity in the plots that had rye vetch as a cover crop. Um, and at least on July 25th, it looks like there was actually more disease in the rye vetch plot. So our hypothesis so far at least was not true that using vetch as a cover crop uh, would reduce powdery mildew severity. Um, I would say that we, there probably, we, there's more work to be done there than that, than that first pass. Um, we did find, you don't see it there, but we did find higher yields in the uh, conventional so even, even in 2017 and 2018, we found higher yields despite what looked like higher levels of disease in the conventional. Um, I think a lot of this is probably related to uh, nitrogen availability because we're using synthetic fertilizer sources. Um, so we need to really think about, I think our, in our organic system, are we getting enough nitrogen? Um, and it's possible that the nitrogen is actually causing the plant to be more susceptible uh, to disease. Um, like I said earlier, the vetch as a cover crop did not reduce powdery mildew um, when grown in rye, but 
I say further testing is needed because we, we really maybe Rye confounded things. Maybe if it was vetched by itself, um, could have had a greater impact. And we've been thinking about uh, are we using the right mixture or the right uh, seed? You know, are we do we have basically do we have do we have too much Rye in our mixture, um, which might be tying up nitrogen uh, to the to the squash? Uh, we probably need to do some testing over multiple seasons. Uh, we really need to look at it in our no-till system and we need to do better control for crop fertility considering that the organic and conventional are, are managed differently. Um, but e either way, this is just one subset. I just want to make it clear that cover crops are still a very important part of organic disease management, especially to break disease cycles, um, to give fertility to the plant as well as to feed the microbiology in the soil. A few takeaways from today's webinar is that there really, you really need to have a focus on IPM prevention and cultural management, especially in an organic farming system because we really can't fall back on, one, we, we can't and we really shouldn't be relying on a chemical control strategy. Um, crop rotation is probably the greatest tool that we have. Um, I think that there's advances being made. There's new tools almost every day or yearly that are available. Um, there's new varieties that are coming out. Uh, there's new methods that make things more efficient. And there's more of these bio and biochemical pesticides that are available to farmers. And we have better information about whether they're eff their effectiveness. Um, and that's, that's kind of goes to the third one. And I would say that uh, Planning and management are the most valuable tools in farming. Um, if you want to be an organic farmer, um, if the only thing you can think about is what to spray and when to spray it, then you're going to really be, you know, you're up against the wall. Um, what separates really good farmers and in many cases organic farmers from other farmers is their ability to manage and plan and think ahead. And that's really what's needed um, for disease management in organic vegetable production. So I think that's the end. And um, I will take a look at the Q&A. I know I've gone probably longer than I expected. Hopefully some people are still hanging with us. Um, I'll take a look at the questions. I put myself on the fruit, not Gladys there. Uh, I thank people for telling me about their production and what they're doing. Um, let me take a look to see if we have any questions. And, I, and we, I put my information here because I know that some of you probably have to leave. It's three o'clock, um, but I want you to be able to get your questions answered. Um, okay, so one question is how can you practice crop rotation in a small home garden? So I still think it's possible. Uh, you know, if you have beds, if you can move them around uh, year to year. Uh, again, cover crop is, cover crops are critically important um, because they can break those disease cycles. Um, compost is again important in reducing the levels, um, but I do think it can be, can be a challenge in small, small gardens. Um, someone here says they have issue with mites. Um, yeah, the, the, with mites, I would say that Things like um, ladybug beetles are, can, can wipe out a mite population. So if there's a way to encourage uh, predators and ladybugs in the, in the garden or in the fields, um, read that guide that Gladys has on creating insectary strips. Um, have, in, encouraging diversity can often control mites. Um, a lot of times mites live under the leaf and coming with a, some sort of spray which might kill them often doesn't even touch them. Um, so you're doing more harm than good. Um, any hand roller crimpers for the small garden? Um, so we have, a, we have a picture, I didn't show it here. Somebody took a two by four, uh, screwed a, a angle iron that you could probably get at most hardware stores already made up and ready to put on to make a hard edge. They took uh, some rope to put down 
and tie it between each side of the board so that they can lift it up and down and use their and then push with their foot on the edge of that angle iron and you could pretty much you know move move inch by inch along uh, to kill I would say that if you're in a really small home garden though what we've struggled with is if we use a sickle bar mower and undercut the mulch then getting in there with equipment like transplanters uh, can sometimes grab that mulch and bind it up but if you're going to plant by hand simply undercutting with a machete or something like that is another another tool um, that can be effective um, how much space do you need between plots when planning crop rotation um, i would urge you to take a look at those manuals that i talked about because some of it has to do with the disease and how it spreads so if it can easily spread by wind um, or you know move even small distances like 10 15 20 feet um, then you may want to consider what is growing next to you know what crops are growing right next to each other um, in some cases it might not matter at all in some cases it might be critically uh, important so i think there it's hard to answer that without knowing what disease uh, exactly you're you're trying to control um, so what is the best time to begin looking for pests, uh, beetles, mites? Uh, I think it's one has to be know your, know your crop and when they start to come in. Um, we start to do it really, I think June 1st, absolutely we start to do it. That's when most things are planted. Um, of course, this is, that's in the Northeast. I'm not sure exactly where, where you are, but um, probably by that time, you know, you can escape a lot of pests early on. So um, sometimes it's not as critical early on. So I, I think it really depends on on the on the crop and when the crop was planted. Um, and I think that's all the questions. So I thank everybody for uh, for being here today. I'm going to uh, end the webinar but you have our emails there we have your questions um, and I and I, someone did say here is it possible to get these slides I it's my understanding that this webinar will be online at the Rodale Institute website and be available to freely get to look at so you won't necessarily have the slide deck but anytime you could you could come back and take a look at the, the presentation um, so hopefully that helps with being able to find some of these resources. Um, so thank you, everybody. And I'm going to uh, end the webinar.